Welcome everyone. We'll be having this seminar in English because we have English speaking guests. Um, I'm, I work for Oxfam in Sweden. We're an international aid organization who fight poverty. We work with uh, helping people lift themselves out of poverty. And we're also a humanitarian organization working in emergencies and catastrophes. And we work with advocacy in trying to change the, the, the settings that keep people in poverty. And the, the reason that we're engaged in the climate change issue is that it's obviously hitting the poorest the worst, and they're also the least guilty of emissions. And today we'll talk about environmental awareness. It's not enough, uh, and is it a target for our consumption-based emissions needed? Oxfam published a report a couple of years ago that showed that the 10 richest percent in the world were responsible for the 50% of consumption-based emissions in the world. And the poorest 50% of the world only were responsible for 10% of emissions. And you can't really see it here, but it, it compares countries that are quite poor and it looks at their emissions and most poor countries have emissions under one ton per per capita of, of carbon dioxide, um, but in, in countries like Sweden it's, it's 10 times higher. Um, and as I said, the ones who are the least guilty are, are the ones that hit the most, the hardest. And Sweden is, to a large extent, part of these richest 10%. And if you look at Swedish uh, greenhouse gas emissions from consumption, you can see that, well, they're not increasing that much, but they're not decreasing either. If you look at the, the bottom one here, um, the, the blue one, that's Sweden consumption-based emissions in Sweden. And just to clarify, consumption emissions, that's all the emissions that result from the things that we do, the, the planes that we take, the things that we import, uh, even if, it, if it's produced in Sweden or not, it's emissions that, well, a result of our consumption, both public and private. So emissions in Sweden, our consumption emissions in Sweden have been decreasing, but at the same time, the imported emissions have been increasing. So the, the end result is, is sort of stable, and they're very high. They're, almost double as high as the production-based emissions. And that's what you normally talk about when you talk about emissions. That's what's reported to the UN, and that's what Sweden already has goals to reduce, etc. But these emissions from consumption, uh, especially the ones that are imported, are not addressed. Um, the, and we think that there is a need to reduce them, and there's an initiative called the Climate Goal Initiative, where Oxfam is a part also. Uh, the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation, um, WWF, Greenpeace, etc., that calls Sweden to, to implement a goal to actually reduce, uh, to reduce the emissions from consumption. And today to, we have uh, David Anderson from Chalmers, who will talk a little bit more about how people consume and how it's related to emissions, so what is actually needed for, for people to be able to reduce uh, the, their emissions. And then we'll have a discussion about that and this wider issue uh, with uh, Kevin Anderson, who's a Sundstrom <laughs> Professor of uh, Climate Change Leadership at the Center for Sustainable Development, Siemens, at Uppsala University, and also Deputy Director of the Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research Search. And also Karin Lexian, who's the General Secretary for the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. I think it's very but now we'll, we'll have a, a, a small talk from David about his, uh, his research uh, on emissions. Please take this floor. Thank you, Robert. Um, now that the sun is coming through here, so you don't, you, you don't see anything, I guess. This is just a messy table, so we don't have to look at that. But so I'm um, David, and I work at Chalmers. So done my PhD a couple of years ago and uh, looking specifically on measuring household greenhouse gas emissions and try to understand which factors affect household greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and uh, there are, so in order to do this we, we uh, sent out a survey to about 2,000 uh, households asking them about different aspects of their lives, trying to uh, estimate their emissions as good as possible. That, that's really tricky and a lot of work, so I spent a lot of really boring time doing that, but now I'm, I can present this to you, so maybe it was worth it. Um, and it also resulted in, a, in an article that uh, is named Explaining the Variation in Greenhouse Gas Emissions Between Households. And, ah, okay. Ask me what I see, I mean, I'm not sure. 
Um, so, basically, different academic approaches have tried to understand uh, environmental behaviors um, from different angles. Uh, a, a first approach, or one approach, um, you can see it. Can you see this? Okay, all right. I can read it also. Uh, one approach is, of course, uh, from consumption research, where we have looked a lot of, on uh, variables such as income, household type, gender, age, and try to understand how these different factors affect uh, the greenhouse gas emissions of a uh, household. Cut me from, if, once you're a teacher, you just, when, once you start talking, you just talk and talk and talk. <laughs> so, tell me. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so that's, that's one approach, just looking at the, the bottom lines, different uh, factors. Uh, another avenue of research is coming from environmental psychology, uh, where, where you've tried to, you've built a lot of theory around how to understand why people change behavior, and uh, a lot of very, uh, what do you say, uh, tricky models of trying to, to uh, explain that behavior and behavioral changes. Um, um, and among different things, you've looked at pro-environmental attitudes and also social norms and a lot of other factors. Uh, and a third avenue of research is stemming from urban planning research, uh, where you have looked mostly at physical factors, so the type of dwelling, the, how the city looks like. Uh, so that's basically the, the physical preconditions for our life. And, uh, how we need to transport ourselves, how much uh, energy is used in our housing, and factors like that. So that's three different factors, and we try to bundle them all up and uh, measure them together. That was very, of course, uh, tricky since we're not experts in all these fields, but I think we did a fairly good job. Um, and so we, we asked all questions related to all these uh, different uh, academic approaches in the survey and also measured the greenhouse gas emissions. And here we have something of a stretch for you to understand maybe. Some of you, when you look at this, think that, okay, I'm gonna stop listening right now because this, this looks horrendous. But this, what it is is basically, down here is, it says tons of carbon, di carbon dioxide emissions per year. Uh, so from, from so, and these are the households in the survey. And this is just the number of households. So, for example, we got maybe seven households with very low e emissions here, four, oh no, three tons per year. So typically students here, poor, maybe eating a vegetarian diet or something, not flying that often. And so this is a the typical bell curve with an average of eight tons uh, in this sample. This is only consumption you hear of. Also, that you should add the uh, emissions from the government spendings, and that adds about 20%. So it takes us to the 10 tons that the official statistics tells us. And also, uh, households over here on 20 tons, of course, with a, or a, an individual with 20 tons a year. So that's a bit, a bit more. Um, so this is emissions, and if we look at how um, okay, now I'll try to explain this in a good way. Uh, if we look at how differences in net income, what that takes us uh, in in the high and low, try to do you see? Me? Oh, okay. So that's the mean, eight tons per year. Uh, if we take one standard deviation, uh, that's about thirty percent of the sample lower uh, income per year. I think the average income here was around 300,000 kroners per year. So if we take one standard deviation, that's about 80,000 per year. So if you earn 220,000, then our best guess on your greenhouse gas emissions would be that they are roughly six tons per year. Do you follow? Okay, and you can also take the standard deviation to the other side. So earning uh, 380,000 per year, and then you are up the best guess on where you would be placed here is on 10 tons per year. Of course, there's a lot of variation here. You could uh, fly a lot, or you can fly less. But, so that's just a rough estimation. But that's given that we would only know your income, we could roughly 
guess where your emissions would end up. So, and this tells us, of course, that and the, the model captures about 50% of the variation, but that's, that we shouldn't go into that. Um, so the, the, the idea, or the point is that changes in income, of course, explains a lot of the difference in greenhouse gas emissions. We, you know that from before, this is not the only study that has shown that, but we showed it with uh, very detailed data. Uh, so that's, uh, you, you, you already knew that, I guess, also that income matters. We spend all our money, Swedes spend typically a lot of our money, uh, so, and that ends up in emissions sooner or later. Uh, so let's look, look at the other factors that we looked about. Uh, the other uh, thing that we measured was pro environmental attitudes. And so that was basically asking people how important do you think the, the climate issue is? Uh, how concerned are you with this issue? And uh, other questions like that. And we also, here we can also take a standard deviation. So this, this thin line here. It, that's the part of the sample saying that they are really concerned with climate change. Uh, and they, or I'm sorry, or the other way around, they emit about 200 kilos less than the average. And that's the same on the other side. So basically, attitudes doesn't really matter for greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we, we say that we care, but maybe it doesn't really tra translate into behavioral changes. I think that's... Uh, Ah, we can talk about that later, but <laughs> it's a bit of a disappointing figure. Uh, we, we continued looking at the, uh, looking at the distance to different um, uh, social services. That made some a somewhat bigger effect. If you're close to dif different services, you tend to have lower emissions. And we also looked at the difference between dwelling type, living in a private house and a, an apartment. And that had a, had a bigger effect. So, going from in a, if you live in an apartment, our best guess would be that you emit about seven tons per year, while living in a detached house is more like eight tons per year. And since this is a linear regression, you could also add them. So, a low-income household <laughs> living in an apartment would end up statistically on 5.6 tons per year, while a highly high-income household with living in house uh, emits about 10.9 tons per year. So that's, uh, that, that's, um, that's basically saying that, uh, or the results of the study says that, I'm, I'm going to read this because otherwise you're going to read it and I'm going to talk about it. So. Uh, the results stress the importance of explanatory variables that have to do with circumstances rather than motivations for pro environmental behaviors. Net income was found to be the most important variable to explain greenhouse gas emissions, followed by dwelling type and geographical in distance to the workplace. So that's it. Uh, what I haven't shown before, but, but that we also found, and maybe some kind of hope here maybe, is that uh, the results also indicate that social norms related to greenhouse gas intensive activities, for example, transport, uh, may have a larger impact than differences in pro environmental attitudes. And that's also more of a general lesson learned that what you think others do or uh, think is important has more effect on your behavior than your own attitudes. So you talk about second order beliefs, that they are, they are stronger in predicting behavior. Uh, so norms more important than attitudes uh, for ch changing or shifting behavior. That's basically the, the fun part <laughs> of, of that uh, uh, article. Uh, I, hope, I hope you followed. Was it okay? Yeah. Great. So you can see this is a background for the discussion on how to do emissions. You want us? Great. Thanks a lot, David. <laughs> so when I saw your article, when it was published, I was like, really, I found it very interesting. It was like a wow effect. Finally, someone shows, shows this in, in detail, in numbers. And because I, I, the way I perceive the general debate in, in Sweden and other countries is that there's a lot of focus on, on information and on labeling. If you look at the government's strategy for sustainable consumption, there's a lot of initiatives there around 
increasing awareness, uh, having labels on things so people know what is more carbon intensive, etc. Uh, changing attitudes, etc. But it doesn't seem like it it's, does has a big effect. So uh, I want to ask Kevin and Karen, where, what is your thoughts around this? How, how do you react seeing this, this study? Start with Karen. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not so surprised. Um, I think we, we are, regarding the consumption strategy from our side, we said that it's good, good first step, but we do believe that we need to have a stronger incidents and, and uh, economic steering um, mechanisms because, as as you, you showed, it's uh, it's difficult. Even though you want to do the right thing, there's so many things that prevents you from doing that. And sometimes I think we put too much on the individual consumer. I think it's important to look at the consumption, but I think sometimes we put too much burden to the individual. And, and, and we need to make it easier to do the right thing in, in different ways. And uh, I think that, that steering mechanism is one very important way of doing that. And then Maybe we can take that in the next round, how to deal with the, with the climate emissions related to, to consumption. Uh, I, I have one, one example also on the norms you were talking about. Before coming here, I actually went to cut my hair. And, and, um, and my, my hairdresser, she said that yeah, she had a friend who is working for Wing, that is one of the, the travel agencies. And she said that that person that she was about to meet uh, couldn't make it because so many Swedes were sort of jumping on the phone because it was raining and they simply needed to have some sun for their vacation. And I think that is some sort of, maybe not a norm, but it's something that you, you think that I really have to have a very warm vacation and I have to be in the sun. And I think it's almost like a myth. You, you have to have sun at your vacation. I also like sun, but it's something that is that you really have to have a hot vacation, uh, to call it a vacation, and this is something, if, if anyone else is thinking like that, it's very hard to say, no, I'm not gonna fly to, to where I'm going. So it's, it's difficult to change behavior, even though you wanna do the right thing, I think. Kevin. Yeah. There's obviously a lot, in, a lot in what you've got there. Is this working okay? There's a lot in what you've got there. Um, and I take the point about responsibility of the individual, but we discussed this in the previous session. I think the individual is, not all individuals, but individuals can be the catalysts for change that bring about adjustments to social norms. And, those, and as well as that, those, those changes often can end up anyway with regulatory changes. And regulations also change social norms. And actually, when you look at your, your initial plot, your bell-shaped curve, you could look at that and say, actually, that's quite hopeful, because these are Swedish people. And there are Swedish people there on two, three, four, five, six, seven tons, as there are people on 19 and 20 and 18 tons. Now, my guess is actually there'd be quite a few people in the five to seven tons category who live lives that are not that dissimilar from people in the 13, 14, and 15 tons category. So there are examples in your bell curve about how you can live with the existing structures at half of your emissions. So you can turn that around and say that there are hopeful messages in there. But I do take your point in the end, and I spend most of my life surrounded by people who broadly believe that climate, or I should say conclude, not believe, conclude that climate change is an important issue, but have made no attempt to adjust their lives in any significant fashion. So I don't think giving information to people, and certainly climate scientists are a great example of that, information does not bring about necessarily change in, in isolation. And I think your point on social norms is well made. It's the social norms that are hugely important um, in, in driving that. And I would argue in my area, in climate science, that is so typical. We have the information to say that climate change is a huge existential threat, but the social norms are that we, yeah, that we have research that's all over the world, that we fly away in conferences, and that we also go with our friends on holiday. So our social norms as a group dominate and, and uh, overcome what our science information is actually telling us. And you, you made one attempt a few weeks ago with some others, uh, Kevin, around changing social norms with the op-ed in uh, Dagens Nyheter. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know whether it had much success or not, but uh, we certainly got a lot of emails of uh, people who were very supportive of that. Yeah, to um, stop flying, that was the, yeah. the pledge with uh, yeah. some artists. And other. But what was interesting, actually, on that is that we had some discussions with quite a few of my you know, immediate colleagues and other people saying that the stopping flying 
for a lot of people it was very difficult. It was clearly not impossible because most people in the world don't fly. Um, probably probably 90% or so of the world don't actually fly. Um, but actually, if, you, if we wrote it down instead, perhaps if we'd written that you're only going to fly once every three or once every five years, a lot more people could buy into that. Um, if you've got a family in Australia, well, actually I have actually, but in, uh, that can make it very challenging to think, well, how do I do that? How do I keep in touch with them? So I think perhaps we could have slightly adjusted the language in it to make it more attractive and appealing to a wider constituency. Well, we, we had a discussion within our organization too, and you know, we have a global program for instance, yeah. and we have partners that we need to meet now and then. Uh, so, so that was one of the reasons why we had to hesitate. That, well, you really have, sometimes you really have to travel to, I mean, you, you can take a train or you can take a boat, but it takes, I mean, it's quite, quite a big burden. It is, but I think we have to get our burdens in some sort of perspective. Which is the burden? That it takes us six weeks to go to Australia, or that you live in Bangladesh with one meter of sea level rise and you watch your child get washed downstream in a, in a typhoon that's more severe than it otherwise would be. So I think we have to be very careful when we talk about burdens for rich white people in the Northern Hemisphere compared with the burdens that we are actively imposing I agree. on people elsewhere. But, but, but we're also talking about the about its purpose. And I, I think what, what I'm saying is that maybe if you had twisted it a little bit, yeah, I, if, because we do need front runners, and this is, to, this is to be a front runner. And I believe that you can change behavior by, yeah. by, by changing sort of norms. But then you also need to get the others along. And this is what we're talking about. How do you, yeah. you have the front runners, they are very good, we need good examples, but then how do we move the rest? Yeah, I agree. Or at least uh, many of the rest. Yes, yeah. Mm. So David, I want to ask you, the reactions in your article, what, what is people saying? What kind of conclusions are they making from, from your research? Uh, I'm, I'm struggling just as, as Kevin is, <laughs> I guess, because I, I haven't as anticipated that weak or responsible attitudes, actually. Even though my colleagues had, I, I guess, I was fresh then and still had hopes. No, uh, uh, no, but most people say, yeah, that figures. I, I, I understood that, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, it's also, you, you could maybe go into, this was a couple of years ago, people, I think people, many people would are trapped in that they don't really know what if I'm anyway going to the information and what you could do yourself and moral responsibilities and stuff like that. If you go, it could be that people don't know what to do and what's most important to do and that, that you get stuck there somewhere. You don't know if you should stop eating meat or stop flying or whatever. And that, that could maybe cause less of behavioral change. But I don't know, the, that, that could be something, but... Um, Otherwise, it's, it's, yeah. it's tough graph. But are people looking at, I mean, people with high income are, are emitting more? Is someone making the conclusion that people should have lower incomes? Is that something you <laughs> We did, for sure. No, but uh, of course, looking at this then, and uh, seeing what has happened in Sweden over, over the last 20 years and uh, the increase in, the, there would be increase in emissions if we wouldn't have had an, an increased uh, efficiency uh, during the same time. Uh, that means that a very strong uh, policy could reduce work time and all that typical uh, policies. That would have probably a large effect, but that's not not a very popular policy nowadays. That's something Kevin has been talking about in the past <laughs> I mean, about the, the need to reduce demand as well. And it's not enough. With I heard a talk at the Stockholm Resilience Center a couple of weeks ago where you talked about the. Um, Changing technologies is not enough, that we would need to reduce demand. Do you want to yeah. talk um, more about I mean, that? This, this is the point that uh, we cannot build our way out of the climate problem with low carbon power stations, with solar panels, with wind turbines, with, you know, with nuclear power, which is low carbon, with lots of other problems, obviously. Um, but we can't build our way out fast enough. So if we are really serious about the commitments we made in Paris, which remember are still very dangerous to many people around the world, if we're really serious about those commitments, we have to reduce our demand in the short term. Now that doesn't mean of course everyone, that means those of us who consume the lion's share of emissions, and I think your opening point about 50% of the emissions come from just 10% of the population, we know who that 10% are. Uh, and that 10%, which includes people like me and probably quite a few of us here, um, we need to dramatically reduce our emissions. Now that probably does go along with things like reduced income, which is quite challenging to sell. 
but selling that we can spend more time with our friends or more time uh, um, with our family, depending on how well you get on with your family, um, you know, that may be a sellable option. Uh, when I was, I left school in 1978, and there's a great belief, and of course there was a belief in the 1950s, that these new technologies, robotics and so forth, would mean that people like me would have lots more leisure time. Well, 30 odd years later, I work more hours now than I did in 1978. So it clearly hasn't worked, and if someone said to me, there's some sort of structure that would allow you to spend only three days a week at work, and you could actually spend a lot more time out cycling or rock climbing with your friends, I would definitely opt for that, and with, I would happily take the larger cut of income. And maybe not everyone would be that position, but I think many of us could be sold that as a, as a prospect. Um, we have, and unfortunately, we've got this sort of system at the moment that says progress is, rel is related to what we consume. I'm successful if I have a large house and a big, and a big car and a travel first class and all those other things. And I think we have to start to recognise, particularly from the UK you see that, maybe slightly less than Sweden and sort of very much in the US. But I think we need to, we need to structure that differently. You know, what, what is success? What is progress? What is a good quality of life? I don't think we have to measure it in how much stuff that we actually own. And I think if we can start to rethink that agenda, that would fit very well to trying to get us to the lower end of that bell curve. So something that we encountered when talking about this climate goal initiative and the need for, for goals to reduce consumption-based emissions is that, well, I mean, we can't affect what China does. We were buying things from China. We don't have a responsibility for their production. Um, what do you say about that? Do we have a responsibility for, for emissions that someone else creates, the ones that we import? I mean, almost, if I would say no, then it would be very, no, of course, of course we have. <laughs> And, and also, if you, I mean, it's also a serious discussion, if you look at the, the emissions from goods that we import, and also investments that we are doing actually abroad, these are substantial, and these emissions are increasing. Mm. And uh, we have been, uh, I mean, we're part of that initiative, we think it's very important to try to frame uh, a, a target for, for consumption-based uh, emis emissions. And we, I mean, it, we're talking about a, a big number. So, for instance, it could be around 80 to 90 percent uh, between 1990 and 2045. And, and we think would it be important for several reasons. One is, of course, the reason that you need a steering mechanism, but also because that would play the role of informing the magnitude of what we are talking about. And thirdly, I also am also a fan of, of, of trying to link the different agreements, the global agreements that we, we've been part of. And, and actually in the Agenda 2030, one of the most difficult um, goals, sustainable development goals to, to, to um, achieve also in Sweden is the number 12 on sustainable consumption, uh, production and consumption. So it links very well to, to, to that effort as well to, to try to to apply to, to all those SDGs here in Sweden. So for many different reasons, I think it would be very important to have a goal. And of course we have a, a responsibility and, and we would like to work with our partners, maybe taking the ship them next time we go there, <laughs> but to work together with them on, on this. To, 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 uh, because we believe that they will be really interested in, in working with us on that topic. Or, or, I think it's really important that we do use consumption-based emissions as a complement to territorial or production-based emissions. They both they both are really important. One we know accurately and we and we can control quite clearly. That's our own emissions in our own countries. The other one we can't measure as accurately, um, and we don't have as much control on it. But actually, it's a really important guide to how successful we are in moving away from a high-carbon lifestyle. So I think it is really important that we have both of those those indicators. But I'd also go a little bit further than this. And it's an argument I've made for, for a lot of years now, um, unsuccessfully so far, is that the, if the, somewhere like the EU, basically if, it, if it's stuck politely, stuck two fingers up to the World Trade Organization and GATT rules and these other things that we shouldn't have, um, and started to say that we will put controls on any goods that we import that uh, have emissions above some certain level. So you'd have some sort of standard related to emissions that are imported. Now, that would be problematic under various WTO rules. But I think actually the climate change is slightly more important than WTO rules. And therefore, if we did do that, and the EU stood up for that as one third of the world's trading zone, places like China would complain, and then half an hour later they would have changed their production system and be selling the same goods 
into the UK from a much cleaner energy base. And of course the Chinese are already embedded in this to some extent. They, I mean, they're really locked into trying to do something on climate change. So it would work very well. And once China had made those changes to sell goods to the EU, that means the goods that China sold to everywhere else in the world, including Trump, would also come from a much lower carbon base. So I think it is important that we have a, a, an entity the size of the EU, this is why any one nation I think would struggle to do this, somewhere the size of the EU as a really important training block could stand up against these global agreements that stop us normally putting in these sorts of standards and could put that forward and could start to do that. And which is what it tried to do in a sort of similar way with the emissions trading scheme in aviation, but it backed down in the end under pressure from lawyers and I don't think it should have done. It is such a powerful trading block, people want to sell into the EU. This is partly why I think Sweden is an important catalyst for driving that agenda within the EU. So I, think, I see Sweden as a country, a progressive country, that could drive a real agenda in the EU. And the EU is so powerful as a trading block that actually the globe would have to respond because it wants to sell things into the EU. So I think consumption-based emissions are part of that, are part of that narrative, part of that storyline. I agree, and I also think that uh, you see that the electricity mix in China is decreasing, so emissions are closing in on per kilowatt hour on uh, the EU, and that would mean that it would be much easier for China to join the European, the European Union. So actually, every now and then I see this, and the China also tries to have uh, very similar trading schemes to the EU in order to be able to bridge those two schemes. So I think maybe the European Union could do that together with China in just a couple of years. <laughs> so that, that's a very good and positive picture. And I, I, don't, I don't, every now and then you see that in the news. Uh, so that could be a way forward. I think that's the, like a very interesting opportunity. Great. So that's, that's, a, that's an interesting uh, proposal for a solution. So let's talk more about solutions. What, what, kind of, um, what can we do to reduce this? Uh, especially the important consumption-based emissions, but all consumption-based emissions, well, what steering, other steering mechanisms could we think of that would reduce that? Except cross-border tax adjustments and stuff like that, that would just, that's tricky because it's the size of the emissions from other consumption, from all different goods and services that you can't really control in a very, in a simple way. Uh, so. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's the only thing I see that is, it's not simple, but I think that could work, uh, I'm not sure. Do you have any other good ideas? Well, there are a few things that you could say. You could start looking at the meat, for instance. Um, yeah. Different measures of, 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 of reducing meat. We're not saying you should mm. stop, but, but uh, we're definitely reducing meat, and, and uh, that is one starting point. Mm. Uh, also, I was surprised when I was looking at your reports that that foreign investments are also really important mm. part. Uh, so criteria for 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 instructions to the Swedes, Sweden, both Sweden and EU what they are investing in, both with regard to to ODA, but also with regard to the World Bank and regional banks and what they are investing in, mm. are, are also important parts of that. So I think look at for instance meat and other and other goods. And, and, and look into steering mechanisms like taxes or, or different kinds of fees, I think could be needed. And at least to start looking to that, I think would help. Yeah. I, mean, I, I agree with these. I think there are various financial mechanisms we can put in place. There are the uh, border trade rules and so forth we can put in place because there are lots of things that try to stop us doing that as well. Mm. So I think we have to, we will have to stand up to some of those other structures that that are discussed every year in Davos. Now these are the sort of places that are where the real problems reside. And I don't know whether we can bring those people on as part of the solution. I think that's probably not going to be the case now. I think we will have to fight against that sort of community. I don't think they are necessarily going to be particularly helpful in us moving forward. Um, and here you could look at people like Trump as a, as a benefit here. I mean, Trump, Trump believes in protectionism. So let's apply it. If he wants coal-based energy in, in uh, America, let's apply a carbon tariff to the goods that come out of the US sold into the EU. So we can use Trump's preference for te protectionism to protect our children's future, whereas the carbon emissions of his coal-based economy, if he moves in that direction. So there are, there are things that we need to be doing to, to counter the, what we call the sort of, if you like, the global, these global norms. They're challenging, but climate change is a, is a much more challenging issue. If we're not prepared to, you know, accept the fact that we're going to have to overcome these ridiculous norms that we've set up, 
then we're not going to respond to climate change. So I don't think we're short of solutions, whether that's technical ones, social ones, political ones, or economic ones. What we seem to be lacking at the moment is the courage to put these things in place. And that's why I think the EU is an excellent place, because it, it does have a, I mean, for all of its problems, and it's got many of them, and the Brits think it's got more than most people, um, but the, uh, it has many problems, but it also has one, many wonderful benefits. And that actually that it is a club of uh, thoughtful, relatively progressive countries, um, that have managed to hold peace, at least within their own boundaries, for quite a long period of time. Um, I think that is a, a really hopeful framework for being able to drive global change. So I, I, I am, as a British person, I'm very supportive of the EU, and I wish we weren't going to leave. Um, but I think that's probably a bit late for that now. That's why I'm looking, I'm looking for Swedish citizenship. <laughs> Karen, did you want to ask? I think you need a combination, and I agree with what you're saying. Uh, I also wanted to get back to what you were saying about sustainable lifestyle. You didn't put it that way, but, but that's what you were talking about. Uh, um, some years ago, I was the um, chair, president of Fair, the Fair Trade here in Sweden, and, and for 10 years we moved it from being, it was not all because of me, but I had a possibility to be part of that development, from moving fair trade products from sort of the, the lower shelf somewhere in very far inside of the shop to really become something that many people wanted to have. And there were a combination of our reasons why people started to buy it more. It was information, but it was also that we, we tried to say, you don't only buy this to be a good person, but it tastes good. It makes you feel good. And I think that if we also can present what you're saying with I also like, would like to have more time with my family, actually. Uh, so I think if we can also sell and, and explain what you get instead. But you, uh, that is not the only uh, mechanism. You need. you need a combination, I think, of several different avenues that you work in parallel to make it work. In a moment, I think we'll open up for questions to, to prepare. I just want to add to a little bit from uh, uh, to the solutions that we're seeing baby steps uh, now the government have this uh, tax uh, what's it called tax reduction for for repairs for example that they um, uh, presented last year well, both for bicycles etc but also at your refrigerator etc you can get a reduction for that it's a very small thing but these are mechanisms that could be used using these kind of VAT different types of VAT different types of taxation so let's start with questions we have one over here You, uh, sorry, the question about um, actually values and working at a deeper level for all of what we're talking about, because if you're trying to have this new attractive, low carbon lifestyle, you have to be, you have, that has to appeal to you. You have to not be um, a person focusing on the extrinsic values, but more what we call the intrinsic. So it, did you look at that in the research? Um, that would be interesting to know. Yeah, we actually did, uh, looking at uh, what's called materialistic values. Uh, being more or less uh, status oriented in order to s set your goals. Uh, and uh, our guess there was that probably won't, we won't find anything here as well because we didn't find anything with attitudes and we thought it would maybe work out the same way. But what we found was that people with more extrinsic values were more, a little, not very strong, but it was a significant result that that they tended to fly more uh, than others. Um, not, not a lot more, but and also among their friends, it was more uh, popular to state that you've been traveling far away. So that was more, increased your status in your group. Uh, and that was kind of interesting because we thought that we would find, or typically that research typically looks at uh, buying um, expensive cars, BMWs and stuff like that. And they found results in, in Britain that yeah, people who are within extrinsic values tend to buy more expensive cars and live in more bigger houses and stuff like that. In Sweden, we didn't find that. Uh, we instead found that people fly more, but they didn't differ. Or they lived also lived more in densely populated areas in like, yeah, and very expensive addresses in central parts of town. So we did find some weak results, but it was not, not very strong, I can't say. Um, but that's again. You should look into that more. Um, could have, could have behavioral drivers. Yeah. Okay. 
yeah. Those. Yeah, of course. Yeah, that, that of course sets what sets your dreams and what you value, what where you want to go in your life. But it's, it's still strange that you, even though I, I, I would subscribe to most of that non-materialistic values myself, and I've done ever since I was a kid. But I still I I, I work and consume and just continue with my life. So I'm not sure if it's uh, strong enough. Uh, I don't fly, Kevin, as you know that. <laughs> I just think, uh, this is anecdotal, but I wonder if there's a, if there's a significant generational difference in, in attitudes towards uh, of values. Uh, I look at the people um, that I know who are probably between the ages of, say, 18 and almost up to 30 now, and many of them are living in cities, they don't own cars. They don't. They're not even particularly worried about passing their driving test. When I was 17, the one thing you wanted to do, from the, you, know, you wanted your driving test on your 17th birthday, um, and every, I guess everyone would, at my age would said that. Certainly, all the all the boys that I knew, that was their first thing they needed to do: was pass the driving test and buy a rubbish car. Cause that's all we could afford in those days. And um, I talk to people now, and that's not an interest for them. And, and interestingly, for someone like the UK, because house ownership is so expensive and out of possibility to so many other people now, um, then they are not quite as house proud as people of my generation were as well. Now, it doesn't mean to say their emissions are lower, but they seem to be more interested at the moment in almost experience than material consumption. And the way they seem to compare with each other, the, 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 you know, the values they are using to think about their, within their own group, seem to be much, to do with ex, much more to do with experience. And that does include social media as well as things like travel. It doesn't mean, doesn't mean it's lower carbon, but I think it's a different, it looks to be a different set of values to my generation. And it may be possible to, to tune that set of values so they can be lower carbon. It's very hard to tune material consumption that's lower carbon. But these other ones, I think there may be wells, ways that you could see them um, getting those rewards experientially um, at relatively low carbon levels. I was wondering if you, maybe you didn't look at that, because I, I recognize that very well from, well, my, my, both my daughters, they have no driver's license, they're 22 or 24, and they are not interested. But if they had been at the countryside, they might have, because they, they have cousins so that, that really are still eager to get it. So it depends a little bit on where you live. I, I subscribe to what you're saying, but I think there are also differences between different groups. So yes, yes. that would be interesting to, to look into, I, I think. Uh, and I think values, we, we need to recognize that values is something that is also changing slowly. So, so it, it's not, I think it's a little bit back and forth. I, I also be, believe in the front runners that is sort of moving both norms and values. But I do believe that values, what, what is your driving force is, is very important. And it's interesting to also listen to all the discussions also here in Almedalen about uh, what, what's that in English, psychological um, diseases or, or, or people that are feeling too stressed and, 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 and not feeling well and it's, it's increasing amongst young people. So here's something that, that I, and there you talk a lot about meditation and you need to live a slower life, etc. At the same time as you, I really have to go abroad to, to get some, some warmth. So there's something here that doesn't really match. Well, I was going to say, I, I, you said that values changing slowly. Perhaps that's right when you look back and you think, when do those first changes start to occur? But I think what you know, I've just witnessed in, in, in Southern Ireland, they've just, they're just uh, um, voted in there a prime minister who's both Indian and gay, openly gay. This is Southern Ireland, a Catholic country. I mean, that is, you know, I think that is an incredible shift in values in the country that's occurred over. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you went back 15 years into Southern Ireland and said, you know, 15 years from now you're going to have a, an Indian gay prime minister, you, 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 there's no way that was going to happen. And now it's happened. And it's happened with a very large majority. So I think that what we have seen in quite a few areas, maybe not related to climate change at the moment, but quite a few other areas of, of life, social life, we have seen quite, in some ways, quite rapid shifts. Now, they may have had a long tail trying to build up to that, which is probably the case. But we've also had that with issues of consumerism, so we have had that long tail. And so, and so it may well be that quite a few of these things, we're actually on the cusp of when the thing starts to turn quite rapidly. We won't know that until it's happened, and then you can look back. Maybe that's an overly hopeful view. Um, but.
I'll just crack on. Um, so, uh, Paul Hawken has just published uh, his book, Drawdown. Um, or his book, it's a result of many years of research showing the 100 main things that we need to do to be two degrees target using existing technology and is economically viable. It's absolutely fantastic roadmap. And most of the stuff in there, not all of it, but most of it actually doesn't require a huge change of lifestyle. Interestingly, it's more about changing the way we do things. Um, so it's in that sense a much easier sell. So just interested in the, the panel's reactions. I mean, I'm assuming you're all aware of it, because it's kind of pretty big. Um, <laughs> if you're not, then this is a short question. But I'd love your reactions to it. Does it work? Does it make sense? Well, my, I haven't looked at it in detail, but I'm also very, very aware of it. My immediate thought a lot of the time is that quite a few of the things take time. And the one thing we don't have is time. Um, so that's why I often say there is a life, big lifestyle issue. We can put quite a few of these things in place, exactly that point, using all the knowledge that we have available today. And on the demand side, those things can be quite quick. We change out our cars about every eight years in terms of the most of the kilometers they travel. Fridges about every 10 years, computers every two years. So most of those things can be changed out quite quickly to much more efficient versions of them. But when it comes to supply infrastructure, which is also really important, um, that is not the case. Supply infrastructure takes a long time to put in place. And even if you had a sort of Marshall-style plan like the reconstruction of Europe after the Second World War, it would still take us several decades to shift to a zero-carbon energy system. Um, and that's if you did you know, put every effort into that. And because when you look at the commitments we made in Paris, just think that we will use up the 1.5 degrees C temperature carbon budget within the next few years. Certainly by about 2023, which is when we're next to really going to evaluate the pledges we made in Paris. So in the next five years, we would have blown the budget for one and a half. We can't build our way out of that. That is going to change. We, the only way to stay in that budget is to make significant lifestyle changes to those of us responsible for the lion's share of emissions. But even for the two degree centigrade budget, we have very little time from that. Certainly from an energy perspective, we have probably 10 to 12 years at current levels of emissions which means if you then you want an equity dimension to that, you're probably talking about at current levels, probably only six to eight years for Sweden to go zero carbon if it was to go at current levels. So that's what needs to start to come down now very rapidly. And I don't think you can get out of it mathematically um, with technology and other things at the moment, not within the time frames that we have, and not unless you believe in negative emission technologies, the TARDIS and uh, miracles. But, sorry, but drawdown points to 2020 being the peak and coming down from there. So it is within your... Yeah, but how break. fast does it come down? I mean, it, will it be down? If it one and a half, if it peaks in 2020, it has to be zero carbon by 2023. So three years after when it peaks, we have to have zero carbon around the globe to hold the one and a half. I, that's how I like it. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi. Um, really. I uh, have a question, and you touched on multiple things. I have to, I'm trying to figure out how do I frame this in one sentence. But it's, it's like, I take two assumptions that we focus on behavior and on the con demand and consumption side, and also that we need to change our behavior. But then, uh, and we talked about values, and I think I agree with values. I've been working on the values leadership, and also I'm studying sustainability, so I see these two things going hand in hand. And I, I partly agree with you that there are some core values that remain the same and the other ones keep changing and we all know why they change. It's because of language and the, our communication, what are the things we are exposed to, our realities. And with regard to that, I'm, I'm curious to know that if we always transact or make, make decisions based on income, oh sorry, price, which is monetary, we are always in the materialistic value sort of sphere, then how do we make sure that uh, we go into the other frames, you know? Like, if you have to sell, because that, there's where the point comes, to sell different ideas. Fair trade label, as an example, is to communicate more information other than just the price, that you should buy this because this is fair trade. But if, and price works on supply and demand, and taxes are one instrument, but what are deeper levels of engagement, which don't require much time from people to engage in it, but at the same time, give them a bit of an idea about, okay, this is what we need to do, and this is easy to go. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, get, I don't know, um, 
I guess we already pay a lot of extra for the things that we care about. I think the, the in, in very big increase in orga organic foods tells us that we are willing to pay for things that we value more. Uh, so I'm not sure we have to, have to, of course it would simplify things, but it, it's, these are often new technologies that are more expensive, that needs to be scaled up. So I'm not sure, or I'm not, I'm not sure I get a question, but I think that uh, we don't have to have the cheapest things available. People are already willing to pay extra for feeling good about things, in some sense, even though not about us. I'm also a believer in, in that people uh, actually do things because they think it's right. Um, but I think, well, the, the easy answer is, of course, it's not everyone that can afford, even though he is willing to do the right thing all the time. But that's a, a bit too simplistic also, I think. Uh, but sometimes it maybe is a little bit of a push to, to help when you're standing there. Um, to, to, so, so I think, I agree with you that I think you can change people's behavior without a price sort of push. But sometimes that little push can be what, what makes the, the difference that time. Depends on the purchasing power. So, so yeah. yeah. And it depends from product to product what is important to you at that moment, I think. I mean, pr price is clearly one way we, we can try to change behaviour, but I think it has lots of problems with it from an equity point of view. So we can put the price of energy up, and that means if we live in somewhere like the UK, even more people would be in fuel poverty, living in cold houses with, with damp and fungal problems, and their children having bronchial issues, and that was already happened significantly in the UK. Um, so I think we have to be very careful with price. You know, wealthy professors can buy their way out of the problem. And we've had that for years, and I, 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 so I'm not so keen. I quite like the idea of choice editing for price. And I've had a lot of discussions with big supermarkets in the UK about this. Tesco's always say we can't choice edit. In other words, they can't choose what's on the shelves. They can put labels on it, they can put prices there. I think that's rubbish. Of course they can choice edit, and they are always choice editing. Choice editing to what's given them the most, most amount of profit. The cooperative supermarket in the UK does choice edit. I mean, not, maybe not in exactly how I would like it to do it, but it chooses some products that it thinks are appropriate and some that it does not think are appropriate. So it makes that decision. And ultimately, you know, we all might be interested in climate change because we've come along to an event like this. I do not expect 7.5 billion people on the planet to think climate change is that important. I want us to try and make a world whereby they can live normal lives without worrying about climate change and make the right decisions. So I quite like the idea of choice editing. I quite like the idea of regulations stopping certain things. I mean, not, prices are one tool we can use, but we've been obsessed by that because economists love price. But we need to use regulations, standards, choice editing, and another one I, I quite like, which is a sort of price mechanism, but not completely, I actually quite like the idea of personal carbon allowances. Um, if we're trying to bring around uh, only for certain parts of the world, wealthy parts of the world like Sweden, where therefore actually you would be allowed to fly. Flying is not a problem, but you would live in a house that was very efficient or much colder, um, or you wouldn't drive very much. So you would make your choice as to where you sold, where you used your carbon up. So I think there are other instruments we need to use that could, um, in, in addition to price, I think price is probably only 10%, maybe 20% of the mechanisms we need to use. But ultimately, we have to make this something that is, is possible for people to do without them spending all their time thinking about climate change. That's our job, those of us that are interested in it. Not, not for the rest of the world's population, necessarily. Great. That's the concluding words for today. Our time is up. Thanks a lot to the panel. And to the audience. And if you want to stick around and talk about that, we'll be here, and there's, I'll be here, and there's a room for, for after discussion if there's anyone interested. Thanks a lot, everyone.